Well, good morning. I want to welcome you to the Orchard. My name is Brian Collier. I'm one of the pastors here. We are so glad that you are here today. Um, if you're worshiping here with us in Tupelo or on live stream or north, uh, at Northside, we're just so grateful you've carved out time to be with us. Uh, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 26 this morning. So if you have your Bibles, Matthew 26, we're going to read verses 17 through 30. Matthew 26, 17 through 30. If you uh, have a mobile device, you can go there. If you happen to not bring a Bible with you this morning, we have some folks who are moving around who will loan you a Bible to use. If you'll just raise your hand, they'll bring you one. We would love for you to, to take this Bible and follow along. Um, our, our desire is that you would learn to read the Bible, not just when you're with us on Sundays, but every day of the week. Uh, it's, it's, the, it's the truth of God which orient, orients our lives. Orient, yeah, orients. I'm trying to say orientates. That's not right. Orients our lives around um, what is right and good and pure and purposeful, the purpose for which we were created. It's the Word of God which helps us discern uh, what is right and what is wrong. It is the truths of God which transform our way of thinking, our way of feeling. So we, we want you to take this Bible with you if you don't have one that you can read and understand, and we'd love for it to be our gift to you. Matthew chapter 26 verse 17 we're in a series called the seven last days and we're at the place where jesus gathers in an upper room to share the passover meal with the disciples matthew 26 17 here's how it's here's how it reads on the first day of the festival of unleavened bread the disciples came to jesus and asked where do you want us to prepare the passover meal for you as you go into the city, he told them, you will see a certain man. Tell him, the teacher says, my time has come and I will eat the Passover meal with my disciples at your house. So the disciples did as Jesus told them and prepared the Passover meal there. When it was evening, Jesus sat down at the table with the 12 disciples. While they were eating, he said, I tell you the truth, one of you will betray me. Greatly distressed, each one asked in turn, am I the one Lord? He replied, one of you who has just eaten from this bowl with me will betray me. For the Son of Man must die, as the Scriptures declared long ago. But how terrible it will be for the one who betrays him. It would be far better for that man if he had never been born. Judas, the one who would betray him, also asked, Rabbi, am I the one? And Jesus told him, you have said it. As they were eating, Jesus took some bread and blessed it. Then he broke it in pieces and gave it to the disciples, saying, Take this and eat it, for this is my body. And he took a cup of wine, and he gave thanks to God for it. He gave it to them and said, Each of you drink from it, for this is my blood, which confirms the covenant between God and his people. It is poured out as a sacrifice to forgive the sins of many. Mark my words. I will not drink wine again until the day I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Then they sang a hymn and went out to the Mount of Olives. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for your word of truth. And we pray this morning that you would sow that truth deeply into our lives. And that it would take root there. And that it would spring up and bear fruit. That it would change the way that we think. That it would change the way that we feel. And it might change the way that we act. That we might be your people in the world. We, we know this is not just us being more determined. It is a magnificent work of, the pow of your powerful Holy Spirit, and we pray for it in our lives and in our lives together in this time. In the name of Christ, we pray it. Amen. So a couple of weeks ago, I was um, in Oxford visiting our Oxford site pastor, Eric George, over there, and we were eating at one of my favorite eating establishments in Oxford, Big Bad Breakfast. Now, um, didn't I just say Brian loves to eat here just by the title, Big Bad Breakfast? I tried to ask them to add a B, Brian's Big Bad Breakfast, but they're not open to that idea. I don't know why, but it's a great place to eat. In fact, we eat there, so now when I call Eric and say, I'm coming over to meet with you, he says, what time are we meeting at Big Bad Breakfast? He doesn't even ask wherever else we're going. So um, we're sitting in the restaurant, uh, and we're... Um, just kind of talking, catching up, and a woman from Tupelo walks in, who I know uh, fairly well, uh, and she was in there bringing her daughter who goes to Ole Miss in to eat, and she walks through the door, and she doesn't say hello, 
She doesn't say, how's Wendy, my wife? She doesn't say, how's the church? She says, what are you doing here? And actually, she said it more like, what are you doing here? Uh, as in Oxford. And, and she, I don't know why people think I wouldn't go to Oxford. My, my school bias has nothing to do with my food bias. I love great places to eat everywhere. I mean, I love, I love Oxford. Uh, there's lots of great restaurants in Oxford, lots of great places in Oxford. I love Oxford, and I'll just kind of leave it right there, so I'll stop there. It, it's, a, it's a great town, but she, she was not asking in a harsh way, uh, why are you here? She was just a little bit surprised. She was not in a place that she, I was not in its place that she expected to see me. And sometimes people do that. They get a little surprised. You seem out of place. Why are you here? You don't, you, you didn't seem like you belong here. And that's one, one thing that happens. But sometimes we get in those circumstances in our own lives where we ask ourselves, what am I doing here? Or we have this deep sense that wherever we are, whether it be a, a geographical place or a or an a emotional or a relational or circumstance, uh, we end up feeling like we don't belong. We're, we're just out of sorts. This is, this is not my place. I don't belong here. Or even ask ourselves, how did I get here? Or why am I here? You ever had that happen to you? You ever, ever been in one of those circumstances, one of those places where you go, I don't, I don't, I don't belong here? I think that's the kind of moment Judas must be having. He's gathered in the upper room with the disciples and Jesus, the other 11 disciples and Jesus, to eat the Passover meal. Now, they've eaten this meal at least uh, one other time, maybe two other times. They've been with Jesus about three years at this point, and Passover is the highest, most celebrated Jewish festival. In it, they celebrate all of the things that God did to rescue them from Egyptian slavery. Passover comes from the last plague where the angel of death passed over the Jews and their families and took the lives of the firstborn of the Egyptians so that in that passing over, Pharaoh relented and let the people of Israel go. So every year at this high and holy moment, they celebrate all the acts of rescue that God has done on their behalf. It's Passover. There, no, nobody misses that. And so Jesus and the disciples gather in an upper room. He tells them where to go make preparations. It's just assumed they're going to celebrate Passover. He tells them to go make preparations. Everything falls into place. Everybody gathers in the upper room for what they think is just, oh, it's another Passover. Nobody can see what's coming. No, nobody knows except for Jesus and Judas, as we see. No, nobody knows that Jesus is about to take the the elements of the Passover meal, bread and wine, and infuse them with new meaning. He, he's going to say before this meal is over, you think it's this, and that's true. It's part of our history. It's part of who we are, the fabric of our lives. But let me tell you, there's something more going on. There's something new I want to tell you about this meal. It's not just a remembrance of the, the mighty acts of God in rescuing the people of Israel. It's going to be a remembrance of all the things that God does to rescue all humanity. They, they, don't, they don't know that. They think they're there for a Passover meal. They, they don't know that before the night's over, they're going to leave that room and they're going to go to a garden and there Jesus is going to be arrested and carted away and there'll be a trial shortly thereafter and there'll be a crucifixion and they'll all be th their lives will be threatened and they'll run for their lives. They don't, they don't know all that's happening. For them, it's just an ordinary night. Except for Jesus, who clearly knows what's going to happen. He announces it. And Judas. Now, Judas, in the early in the story, doesn't know that Jesus knows. And certainly the other disciples don't know. We don't know all of the ins and outs of how Judas has made this arrangement to betray Jesus to the religious leaders and to the authorities. But he clearly has already made the arrangements. Nobody knows. Certainly the other disciples don't know. Because had the other disciples known, they would have taken care of Judas themselves. I don't know if they would have beat him or if they would have killed him or if they would have thrown him out of the group, but they certainly would have never let happen what happens. Judas has, has kept it a secret. It's been private. And, and then Jesus says, they're gathered around the table, they're gathered around the meal, and then Jesus says, one of you is going to betray me. And we see the other 11 a little bit confused. 
Is it me? It's not me. It can't be me. I love Jesus. No, I love Jesus more than you, so it can't be me. It might be you, but it's not going to be me. And they have this conversation. They don't know who's going to betray. But there's one of them that knows he's the guilty one. And Jesus knows. So not only does Judas know he's been found out, he knows that Jesus knows. And you, ha- you, have, to, you have to sense that Judas has this panic. Maybe he breaks out on a cold sweat. Maybe it's the lump in his throat. Maybe it's the voice in his mind screaming, I've got to get out of here. I'm, I'm not where I belong. Maybe it's the feeling, this is not the place for me. I, I'm not welcome here anymore. I don't belong here anymore. I'm not where I should, I'm supposed to be. You ever had those feelings? Ever been one of those spots where you're not where you're supposed to be? You feel like you don't belong? And then all of these emotions, this lump in your throat, this cold sweat, this panic in your body makes you want to run and leave. Most often, I had those feelings when my parents had found out something I wasn't supposed to have done. But we, we have those moments in our lives, don't we? Ju- Judas is having one of those moments. You ever, you ever wondered why? I, I mean, maybe it was an act of impulse. Maybe the religious leaders came to Judas and said, hey, this rebel, this revolutionary leader, Jesus, is not working things on our schedule we're gonna we we think you should betray him we think we should get him in trouble so that he'll finally in revolt call his army together unify the nation and we'll throw off this roman oppression and judas said oh that makes sense to me let's just take one step how can i help and then the next step and then the next step and all of a sudden there's this cascade of impulsive steps that judas can't undo once they've been done and he finds himself betraying jesus maybe that's how it happened Or maybe it was cold and calculated, premeditated even. Maybe, maybe the religious leaders came to Judas, and Judas has said, I've had enough of this. I mean, I thought he was the Messiah, but he's clearly not the Messiah, and we will not move on to the Messiah, the real Messiah, until we get rid of this one. How can I help? Or maybe Judas wanted the money. 30 pieces of silver sounds like a lot. It's really not that much. Maybe Jesus wanted the money. Maybe, maybe he followed Jesus with good intentions at the beginning, and then somewhere along the way, he got disenchanted and thought, I need a way out. I'm not sure how to get out. I'm just going to do this, so I'll be free. We don't know why. But the whys are really not important. Jesus looks beyond the whys and does something that is completely unexpected. Judas doesn't belong. I'm sure he feels like he doesn't belong. He's not in the place that he should be. But Jesus thinks differently about this. We, we, they're, they're gathered in the upper room, and uh, in, in our minds, when we, we look at this meal, sometimes if we grew up in the church, maybe sometimes if, even if we grew, didn't grow up in the church, there's this, this picture, this idea of how this meal was going. Uh, it's traditionally called the Last Supper, and Leonardo da Vinci has a very famous picture of it. Uh, this is his depiction of how that supper would have been. It's like uh, sometimes we think, oh, all the disciples got together and somebody took a picture as the meal was going on. Hey, Peter, you're a little bit too far to the left. Squeeze in. Everybody squeeze in. Take a picture. Uh, th- obviously, this is Da Vinci's depiction. And the problem with this, this is this one long table. And, and, and that's not the way it would have been because then Judas could have gotten down to the end and go, well, I hope he's not looking at me. I, I hope he's not looking at me. When he says, one of you is going to betray me. Oh, my, what am I going to do? No, uh, more accurately, they would have had a meal around something called a triclinium. It's a three-sided table, U-shaped, like this. And the host would have sat in the middle of that table. And the closer you sat to the host, the greater the place of honor. Now, when we read this account of, uh, in John's Gospel... John says that Jesus handed Judas a piece of bread. So that means, uh, well, we, we can surmise, probably that means Judas was seated close to Jesus. We don't know exactly where he was. It was close to Jesus. So he is in a, a fairly honorable place. He didn't, hand the, he didn't hand the bread to Peter right here and go, hey, Judas is sitting over there. Y'all pass that around to Judas. It says he handed Judas the bread. And this is where it becomes un- unusual because you, you, don't, you don't eat with your betrayers. You only eat with friends. 
And it was a great honor to be seated near the host and an even greater honor for them to offer you a piece of bread because that piece of bread was hospitality, that piece of bread was blessing, that piece of bread was grace, that piece of bread was belonging. Now consider this. Peter, uh, Judas says, I, I don't belong here. I, I, I'm an outsider here. And Jesus says, I'm offering you the place of honor and I'm offering you the bread of blessing even though you're my betrayer. Ever had one of those moments when you're sure you don't belong, that you're not in the right place, that you've been a betrayer, and Jesus says, no, I want you to have the seat of honor, and I want to offer you the bread of grace and the bread of belonging. Now, for us, if it had been our betrayer, what would we have done? Confront, right? I'm in. Uh, that, that's, that's clearly what I would have done. If, if your betrayer is in the room with you, seated at the table with you, you're, you're not going to offer them honor and, and grace. In fact, we don't even eat with our enemies. We wouldn't eat with our betrayers. Today, when you leave church and you go to lunch at your favorite restaurant, how many are you going with somebody you don't know at all? Anybody? Complete strangers. Anyone? Anyone? No. Okay, how about, how many of you are going to go eat with someone who you know is, a, is your enemy, is going to betray you at some point? Anyone? Anyone? No, no, no. Who do we eat with? People who we can trust. People who are our friends. I would say people who are our family, but sometimes that's not the same. You know. Jesus offers an enemy, his betrayer, the bread of acceptance, the bread of blessing, the bread of grace. He gives him the seat of honor when he, when he should have confronted him. You, you understand like I do, this is the son of God. He could have dealt with Judas any way he wanted to. I, I sometimes imagine uh, Jesus with all of the imagined superpowers of our superheroes. He could have used the x-ray vision like Superman and just fried Judas. Like, oh, we're done. Drag his body out. I don't have to worry about that anymore. The worst thing he probably could have done is told the disciples, one of you is going to betray me, and it's Judas. Y'all take care of that. And they would have gladly, I'm sure. But Jesus doesn't confront him that way. He does confront him. He, he first announces the sin. He says, one of you is going to betray me. Jesus knows. Judas knows. Judas, he's saying, you're going to betray me. There's this confrontation where he goes, Judas, what, what is it? Is it, a, is it a price? Is it greed? Is it enticement? Is it power? What are they offering you for your life in relationship with my life? He offers Judas he offers Judas his life. And Judas says, no, I'm going I'm, I'm to go another way. He confronts Jesus, Judas with this truth. He confronts Judas by saying, it's, it's one of you who's near me. I'm not an unknown to you. They're sitting in this track cleaning, this table. Everybody's face can be seen. You can't hide from one another. And then he offers Judas another confrontation when he says, uh, one of you is one of you's going to betray me is one of you who dips your hand in the bowl with me, but none of the Gospels, Matthew or Mark who, and or Luke, who look at all of these, uh, t this story, and John, which tells the story a little bit differently because it doesn't, it doesn't uh, uh, give us the same details as Matthew, Mark, and Luke, none of them say Judas leaves the table. He stays. One of you is going to betray me. It's you, Judas. Mind if I hang around for a while, Jesus? Judas does not belong. By our estimation, Judas does not belong. By Judas's estimation, he did not belong. Jesus thinks differently about this. He confronts Judas, but he doesn't banish Judas. Instead, he offers him the bread of grace. There's one other passage, one other verse in this passage that always perplexes me. It's verse 24. It's where Jesus says, one of you is going to betray me, but woe to the man who betrays me. It would have been better for him if he had never been born. Now, we, we don't know, I don't know, the tone of that. But it, it, you can imagine it one of two ways. Jesus says it very vengefully. One of you is going to betray me, but woe to the man who betrays me. It would have been better for him if he had never been born. I'm going to get him. It's going to be terrible for him, it's going to, and rightly so. 
Or maybe, or maybe Jesus says it this way. One of you is going to betray me. But woe to the man who betrays me. It would have been better if he had, if he had never been born. See, I, I think that knowing what we know about Jesus, that Jesus is grieving more over what Judas's decision means for Judas than what Judas's decision means for Jesus. Jesus is going to go to the cross. It can't mean any more for him. Judas's decision can't mean any more for him than it already does. I, th- I think he grieves over what Judas's sin and rebellion and betrayal means for Judas. Judas thought he didn't belong. Jesus thinks differently. You ever have one of those moments? You. You ever, you ever have one of those moments? I'm not talking about those out-of-place moments where you're in a restaurant in a wrong town and people go, what are you doing here? I'm talking about Judas-like moments. One of those where your impulses got the better of you and you made a bad decision, a poor decision that turned into a bad decision, that turned into a terrible decision, that turned into a devastating decision, not just for you but for all those around you. And now you live with those. You, you would like to run and hide, but you can't. You didn't wake up that day thinking, I'm going to blow up my life and, and deeply hurt or destroy all the people around me, but the collateral damage is evident. It was an impulse. There were several good opportunities for you to say no, but you just kept saying yes. And now, that circumstance, that relationship that you're in, you feel like you don't belong. You're the betrayer. You're the one who, who broke who, who got started the brokenness that is so evident in all of the, all of the people in that circumstance. Or, or, or maybe, maybe it was cold and premeditated. Maybe you were very calculated in your sin. Uh, my, my wife really likes to watch uh, 48 Hours. I don't like to watch 48 Hours. Uh, I've got enough true crime in my life without television. But there's... there's it's true crime television, and she finds the stories fascinating. And to be fair, I say I don't want to watch it, but every time she turns it on, I find myself on the couch watching it too. So this is my convenient way of blaming her for my problem. So the, the stories are fascinating. If you're not familiar with 48 Hours, it's true crime, and most of them are, are I mean, some of them are unsolved. Some of them have taken years for the cases to be solved because the people who have perpetrated the crimes have so deviously and over a long period of time set up a crime or set up, set up uh, uh, some evil for days or weeks or months or sometimes even been playing somebody or some circumstance for years in order to commit the crime. And I watch those shows and I think, how, how evil and dark the human heart. It's terrible. How could anybody, how could anybody be like that? But, but I've come to understand one of the reasons I don't really care for the show is that I find it repulsive, but I also find it familiar. And I don't, I don't mean familiar in, in the sense that for days or weeks or months or years I've set up some crime in order to kill somebody. But I recognize the days or weeks or months or years, the cold, premeditated calculation of my betrayals and my sins of Jesus. You ever have one of those moments? It doesn't matter if it's greed or lust or envy or pride or it doesn't matter what avenue we choose. A betrayal's a betrayal. And I look in the mirror and I see a betrayer who is be- not just, a, it's not just a one-time thing. It's not just a moment. It's betrayal upon betrayal upon betrayal. And I, I look at Christ, I look at Jesus, and I think, I don't belong. I have no place here. As long as I can keep those things at arm's length and excuse them, but when I begin to see them as sin, which they are, when I begin to see them as sin, I can't help but see them as betrayals. And whenever there's a betrayal, someone has to have been betrayed. That's Jesus, and somebody has to have betrayed, and that's me. And I think, 
Jesus can't love me. I, I, don't, I don't belong. I need to get out of here just as fast as I can. Or I think, well, this is who I am. This is what I do. I'll just keep doing what I am. Ever have one of those moments? But to you and to me, Jesus offers the bread of grace. He shows us the cost. He confronts us. He, he, he confronts us in the same way he did Judas. He says, one of you is going to betray me. And, and the, the step toward healing, the step toward, toward, toward being made right with Jesus is not to go, is it me? But to say, oh Lord, it's me. Jesus says, I'm not a stranger to you. Look me in the face and, and tell me you still want to do what you're about to do given our relationship, and I, and I do. Jesus says, I'm going to offer you the bread of grace, but I want you to see the cost. It's, it's my body broken and my blood poured out. Given that price, is it still worth it to you? Judas doesn't belong. So often we feel like, rightfully so, that we don't belong. And, and yet Jesus offers us the bread of grace for all of the reasons that we can say, I don't belong, for all the ways that we can go, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not yours, Jesus. I don't follow you, Jesus. Jesus thinks differently. Carl Bart is a name that many of you would not know. He is a world-renowned, was a world-renowned theologian. He's written volumes about the work and the nature of God and the nature and work of Jesus. It's high and heady stuff that most seminarians uh, have to dig into at some point in their education. Uh, he was at a seminary in Germany, and he was given lectures, and they arranged afterwards for him to kind of do a little Q&A with pastors and some of the professors at the seminary, and they said to him, uh, Carl, Dr. Bart, um, what is the highest and most profound truth you know about God? Now remember, this is a guy who's written volumes and volumes, stuff that most of us, including me, can't get our heads around. And his answer was this, the most, the most high and profound truth I know about God is this, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. I don't know about you, but the voices in my life, the voices that come even from my own heart, tell me I don't belong, that I, that I can't be loved. But this voice, the Word of God, and the voice of God tells me that because Jesus has offered me the bread of grace at great cost to himself, then I am invited to take the seat of honor as a dearly beloved son or a dearly beloved daughter of God in spite of the fact that I am a betrayer. I, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know what circle you're in or what circumstance you're in in which the voice in your head or the voice in your heart or the voices around your life are saying you don't belong. But for all of the reasons you can come up with that you don't belong, I want you to know that Jesus thinks differently. He doesn't ignore your sin, he doesn't ignore my sin, but he deals with it at great cost to himself that we might be embraced instead of shunned. In just a few moments, we're going to take communion together. You're going to come forward, and someone, the server, is going to tear off a piece of bread and hand it to you. And um, that is a reminder that Jesus offers. We don't, we don't take the grace of God. The grace of God is offered to us. You just cup your hands like this. They're going to tear off a piece of bread and place it in your hand. There's a part of communion um, language that we sometimes miss, and I want you to pay special attention to it today. When you come forward and they tear off a piece of bread and they hand it to you and you dip it in the cup, you tear off a piece of bread and they go, the body of Christ. Or you dip it in the cup and you hear the words, the blood of Christ. But here's, here's the important words I want you to hear today. The body of Christ broken for you. 
the body of Christ broken for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. The blood of Christ shed for you and for me. So that in spite of all of our betrayals, in spite of all of our reasons that we don't belong, we receive the bread of grace and know that we are the beloved sons and daughters of God because of what Christ has done on our behalf. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the Most High God, have mercy on us for we are sinners, betrayers. But because of your mighty acts in Christ Jesus, we are embraced as your dearly loved children. You proved your love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Lord, would, would your voice be the loudest in our lives? Would your voice be the loudest in our mind? Would your voice be the loudest in our heart? Would your voice be the loudest in our ear? That reminds us of who we are and what you have done. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen.